Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar about exploring safety issues in antimicrobial drug development. This webinar was collaboratively developed by Guard P, Carbex, JPI AMR, Repair Impact Fund, Wellcome Trust, ASM, and ESCMID. It is part of our Antibiotic Bootcamps for Developers series, which we have been developing with our partners at the ASM ESCMID conference on drug development since 2017. As this conference, as so many others, could not be held this year, we decided to move it to our um, Revive webinar program. Revive is Guard Peace Education and Outreach Program, and it was officially launched in 2018. Uh, it aims to connect and support the antimicrobial uh, R&D community by facilitating learning, sharing knowledge, and connecting people. All our webinars are recorded in full and can be watched later on our website, revive.guardp.org slash webinars. As always, uh, today's presentations will be followed by a Q&A session. Uh, you can submit your questions at any time during the webinar by uh, using the questions window in your webinar control panel. And as we will have three speakers today, I would ask you to, if your question is for one specific speaker, to act, uh, include his or her name in your question. And we will do our best to respond to as many questions as possible. And today's speakers are Will Redfern, Julie Eakins, um, Paul Watkins, and our moderator is um, Claire Sadler. Um, Claire is a project toxicology consultant at Upconix, and she actually uh, was speaking on one of our first webinars in 2018. So if you're curious to see her presentation, you can still find it on our website. Um, so welcome, Claire. Um, I will now hand over to you for, uh, to welcome our speakers. Thank you, Astrid. I'm delighted to introduce today's speakers, Will Redfern, Julie Eakins, and Paul Watkins. Will Redfern is the Vice President of Quantitative, to Quantitative Systems Toxicology and Safety in Citara, UK. He's an incredibly experienced safety pharmacologist with a particular interest in neurosafety pharmacology and who I had the pleasure of working with within AstraZeneca for many years. And as such, he's very familiar with some of the neurosafety issues specifically some that face antimicrobials. He's the former president of the Safety Pharmacology Society and is a fellow of the Royal Society of Biology and of the British Pharmacological Society. Julie Eakins is a senior research scientist within the toxicology group at Ciprotex, where she is responsible for developing and performing new in vitro assays. Jo Julie joined Ciprotex in 2014, having previously spent many years at AstraZeneca. I work closely with Julie AstraZeneca, where her work supported many anti-infective projects, specifically understanding mitochondrial toxicities. And lastly, Paul Watkins, a well-renowned scientist within toxicology. He's a Howard Q. Ferguson Distinguished Professor of Medicine, Pharmacy and Public Health and Director of the Institute for Drug Safety Sciences at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. He is clinically trained hepatologist with a long-standing interest in drug-induced liver injury. He serves as a co-chair of the steering committee and genetics committees for the US Drug-Induced Liver Injury Network. He also chairs the Scientific Advisory Committee for the DELISIM Initiative, the public-private partnership that produces the DELISIM SIP software that is increasingly used to assess the liver safety of new drug con candidates. I'm now happy to welcome Real Will Redfern. Will, can you start your presentation, please? Thank you. Thanks, Claire. Hello, everybody. <clears throat> So I'm very pleased to be invited to this series of webinars and I'm going to talk to you about drug-induced neurotoxicity. So first of all, what I want to cover today is how we define the term neurotoxicity. Just go through which parts of the nervous system are affected, what sort of chemicals cause it, what the major mechanisms are, and how we can detect it before human exposure. So the broad definition from the US Interagency Committee on Neurotoxicology from 30 years ago 
is quite a broad one. Neurotoxicity is any adverse effect on the structure or function of the central and or peripheral nervous system by a biological, chemical or physical agent. So they're really talking about either permanent or reversible effects and um, result of direct or indirect actions. Whereas in the pharmaceutical industry, um, people tend to work with a narrower definition of neurotoxicity. And this definition would say that it occurs when exposure to naturally occurring or man-made substances causes damage to nervous, nervous tissue. So in other words, irreversible effects. So this definition wouldn't include reversible pharmacological receptor-mediated effects of centrally acting drugs. And the agents that it does include, we would refer to as neurotoxins or neurotoxicants. And this is important because irreversible damage to neurons is a serious issue because unlike, for example, interstitial epithelial cells, which have something like a five-day turnover, the vast majority of neurons in the adult brain are there for the duration, so you can't afford to lose any. So let's first of all consider the wider definition as a continuum. So on the left-hand side, you have functional adverse effects that are receptor-mediated, and the time course is related to the pharmacokinetics of the drug and is fully reversible. And then you would move into um, adaptive changes, which can involve altered gene expression, epigenetic changes, receptor up or down regulation, altered neurochemistry. And some of these effects persist long after the drug has disappeared from the body. Then you move into structural changes, um, changes in synaptic plasticity, inhibition of neurogenesis, and long-term permanent changes occur to service, to nervous system structure and function. And then finally, neurodegeneration, where there's loss of neurons and or the glial support cells. And in terms of the reversibility, this is permanent changes in nervous system structure and function. So although some drugs begin with effects in the left-hand category and progress to the right, either at higher doses or on repeat dosing, most of the drugs that cause functional adverse effects do not progress beyond causing adaptive changes. The sorts of chemicals causing neurotoxicity, we're gonna focus in this talk on pharmaceuticals, but there's also um, recreational drugs, organic solvents, some of which are used recreationally, heavy metals, pesticides, naturally occurring neurotoxins, some gases, chemical warfare agents, and research tools. So again, if we look at functional and structural neurotoxicity, the set on the left is uh, our typical functional uh, adverse effects of drugs on the nervous system, whereas the structural changes include uh, central nervous system neurotoxicity, peripheral neuropathy, retinal and optic nerve degeneration, and ototoxicity, which is damage to the auditory system. One point to make is that neurons don't exist in isolation and they're supported by glial cells, um, which are also targets for neurotoxins. Neurons communicate with each other largely via specialized junctions called synapses, which is the predominant site of action for acute adverse functional effects, whereas neurotoxicity, uh, where there's irreversible change, can involve any aspect of neuronal or glial function. Um, for example, changes to the myelin sheath, uh, inhibition of axonal transport, and so on, as well as effects on synaptic neurotransmission. There are numerous mechanisms of drug-induced neurotoxicity. So there's some direct ones listed here. For example, uh, disruption of mitochondrial function. Julie's gonna cover that as a specific topic, uh, not just obviously in the nervous system. Um, formation of oxygen-free radicals, 
release of excitatory amino acids, inhibition of ion channels, um, induction of apoptosis, selective depletion of neurotransmitters, and interruption of axonal transport. And then there's a whole list of indirect causes, hypoglycemia, hypoxia, ischemia, disruption of the blood-brain barrier, hepatotoxicity, vitamin deficiency, coagulation disorders, renal failure, electrolyte disorders, and endocrine disorders. And then the other thing to point out is that there are risk factors specific to the individual that can promote or exacerbate drug-induced neurotoxicity. For example, pharmacogenetic differences, uh, both in the response and in pharmacokinetics, uh, aging, history of neurological disorders, compromised brain function, and anything listed under this uh, di indirect list here. You can also get drug-drug interactions as well. Both the brain in general and dopaminergic neurons in particular are susceptible to oxidative stress for reasons that are listed here. And dopamine itself um, has been described by some authors as a neurotoxic time bomb. Um, so give a couple of examples of brain um, or CNS cell types that are particularly at risk of oxidative stress, just picking out this one specific mechanism. So the dopamine neurons in the substantia nigra, um, which has a role in motor function, and you can get reactive oxygen species production, uh, which damages the mitochondria and can cause DNA damage. Similarly, in the retinal pigment epithelial cells, which support the photoreceptors, um, again, you've got a high oxygen supply from the blood, and the, the cells are also exposed to high levels of UV light. So you've got sort of ripe conditions for oxidative stress. If we go through the different types of neurotoxicity, starting with CNS, um, I've listed all the the classes of drugs and uh, particular drugs involved. And you can see there's quite a wide range of pathology or functional changes uh, listed here. So in terms of CNS function, you name it, it can be affected by a neurotoxin. What I've done with the others is where there's um, an antimicrobial drug that's been implicated, I've listed these in blue. So for peripheral neuropathy, you can see quite a few antimicrobials have been implicated and also a lot of oncology agents, but also some other types of drugs as well. And again, um, I'll whiz through these slides quickly, but you can download the talk later to go through it more slowly if you want to know the list of drugs. There are different types of peripheral neuropathy. There are neuronopathies, so these are on the cell body. Um, myelinopathies, which is uh, damage the myelin sheath of the axons and distal axonopathies <clears throat> and different drugs have actions on different parts of these neurons. Moving to the retina, um, numerous drugs, the blue ones again are antimicrobials um, cause damage to the retina and um, there's also quite a disparate um, number of drugs that cause retinal damage. And similarly, optic nerve degeneration, the three listed here that are, are or were antimicrobial drugs, and then quite a few others as well. So um, there's something else to watch out for. And then ototoxicity, um, these antibiotics here um, have been associated with damage to the cochlea. This is particularly important if you're using topical or you know um, drugs that are administered to the ear canal that reach the ear in quite high concentrations. Um, a quote from these authors made the point there's no current screen for ototoxicity in drug development. There's no requirement for it apart from the topicals. And uh, they felt that there's an ethical obligation to identify drugs that are potentially damaging to hearing. And this shows what they do to cochlear hair cells. 
this is the normal arrangement on the left, and then this is after a, an ototoxin has been administered that's basically wiped them out. The other point to make is that some marketed drugs may be occult ototoxins. In other words, they go undetected until they're on the market. The approach is to detecting and assessing drug-induced neurotoxicity preclinically, include in vitro, in vivo, and post-mortem histopathology. And I'll go through these uh, in, C, in series, starting with the in vitro approaches, where there's been significant progress in the last 10 years. And there are various approaches um, with both functional and morphological readouts. And these are increasingly being combined. The other aspect of in vitro approaches is, is there's the option to knock down receptor targets to investigate the mechanism of action of drug-induced neurotoxicity, particularly to distinguish whether it's the primary target of the drug or an off-target activity, because if it's an off-target, you have the option of trying to dial it out of the chemistry. So we go back to just over 10 years ago, this was a, a one of the first papers in in vitro neurotoxicity that was of use to the pharmaceutical industry. And there are two markers here. MAP2 in red is a dendrite marker and actin is a microfilament protein. And you can see these three well-known neurotoxins compared to the control are reducing uh, dendritic processes and also impacting on microfilaments. So that was in rat primary hippocampal neurons. Um, this paper a couple of years later was using a toxin called um, beta bungarotoxin to dose levels, concentration levels, and they were using high content imaging, analyzing neurite outgrowth, and also looking at biomarkers of neurotoxicity. And you can see compared to the control, there's an um, inhibition of neurite outgrowth. Another example, again, with neurite outgrowth, and this is with heavy metal neurotoxin methylmercury, and you can see a concentration-related decrease, particularly in the histogram plot of um, neurite outgrowth. And this one shifted to using um, human uh, stem cell-derived neurons and glia in co-culture. So we're starting to get um, a bit more relevant to the in vivo human situation. In this paper from last year, they were uh, doing um, calcium imaging and looking at firing rate in controls and then a whole series of different neurotoxins causing their own fingerprint of changes of firing rate uh, in 3D cultures. And one issue with using, if you like, a one-size-fits-all fit, neuron or a kind of representative neuronal type is that you know, neurons are quite specialized in different brain regions. And this is a technique with guided differentiation of organoid, organoids into brains, region-specific ones. So if you want the cell type that's um, predominant in the hypothalamus, you could do that, or in the cerebellum but starts to get a bit more relevant to in vivo situations. And again, you can measure morphological, neurochemical, and electrophysiological responses to neurotoxic drugs. And this in vitro assessment was of um, a peripheral nerve on a chip uh, platform. So here you've got primary tissue explants from dorsal root ganglia. And what they do is they form axons down the canal in the um, in the chip after a um, few days and weeks, and then you can make electrophysiological recordings from them, and you can do um, histopathology at the end. And I've just picked out they they tested several known neurotoxins. But the, the black plot is electrophysiology. So this is nerve conduction velocity, which is sensitive to disruption of myelin. 
and the red is the cell viability. So you can see that the, the functional measurement was more sensitive than the histopathology, which is similar to what you get in vivo as well. Um, so this was quite an exciting development for peripheral neurotoxicity. There was also an in silico uh, approach to this, again, published uh, last year. So this is where they were using molecular molecular descriptors from 95 approved drugs, which were um, basically used to train the model. And then they predicted 60 um, oncology drugs um, as to the um, neuropathology in terms of peripheral neuropathy. And as you can see, that it's quite a good um, prediction. I think anyone would be very happy with this level of prediction. Uh, prior to doing even any in vitro studies. So you can start to see a strategy that could develop where you might start with this approach, um, go to an in vitro approach before you, you go in vivo. Just um, stepping back to in vitro, this is a, a more classical in vitro approach, which is a hippocamp or slice preparation, uh, for, from this case from a rat. Uh, you can use other species. So you stimulate the afferents to CA1 cell bodies, which you record from, and send single shot volleys to the cell body. And they show this characteristic response in blue. When you expose the slice to known convulsant agents, you get a lot more happening. So you get the initial um, population spike followed by um, additional um, depolarizations. So you can plot the area under the curve and do nice concentration response relationships. We move in vivo, um, first of all, starting with some tests of nociception. So this is um, equivalent to pain sensation in animals to assess sensory neuropathy. The two terms of um, interest here are hyperalgesia. So this is increased sensitivity to a noxious stimulus. And then allodynia, which is sensitivity to a stimulus that is normally not noxious. So for example, freezing cold water. Um, and these are associated with sensory neuropathy. So you can test um, rats in a tox toxicology study or in a sp specialized study. So you have the tail flick test, which measures the response time to an infrared heat stimulus. Similarly with another part of the body with the sole of the foot of the hind paw and the plantar test, same principle. And then a pressure test on the hind paw. And these are very reproducible and quantitative in vivo, uh, give you a way of following the time course of the effect. Um, and um, again, can be incorporated into toxicology studies or done as a separate study. You can also look at motor coordination depending on where your you know, neurotoxicity is. And again, these are non-invasive and relatively non-stressful. So they include beam walking. So rats don't like being in brightly lit areas and they'll walk along a beam to a black um, dimly lit box. You can measure foot faults and uh, duration of the walk. Similarly, with gait analysis, you can get all sorts of um, measures of sway and speed, etc. And then an accelerating rotor rod, which is a challenge to for the rat to stay on a rotating rod. And then when they fall off, they stop the clock. And again, um, these are very, give some very reproducible um, quantitative in vivo data that you can correlate with histopathology. And unlike histopathology, you can follow the time course. Um, just going into some electrophysiology recording, so EEG, electroencephalography in rodents and other species, um, particularly useful to detect um, the seizure um, effects, inducing effects of drugs. So this shows um, a, um, oops, go back. This shows um, a typical spike and wave response to a seizure-inducing drug. Uh, 
and then electroretinography, which is uh, ERG. Um, and this is a characteristic response. You get what's called the A wave first, which is hyperpolarization of the photoreceptors, and the B wave, which is the molar cells and bipolar cells. So basically, this diagnoses which cell types in the retina are being affected by the neurotoxin. In this case, there wasn't much effect at the low dose, but by the intermediate and high dose, the B wave had disappeared. Uh, so you know that there's something going on with the bipolar cell transmission. And for auditory uh, responses, um, again, you need an anesthetized rat with um, body temperature maintained with a loudspeaker or quality um, sound delivery system. And you step up the amplitude of the sound level until you get a measurable change in the response from the recording electrodes on the scalp. And drugs such as ferrosamide, which is a, a, a loop diuretic, increase the uh, threshold for the, um, the response to occur. So they shove it up, upwards in this um, list here. And you can test at different frequencies across the auditory range in the species. Also emerging are soluble biomarkers, which can be detected both in vitro and in vivo. And until fairly recently, they can be detected in CSF, but now the bioanalytical techniques are improving so they can actually be detected in blood. So this is an area to watch for in vivo studies. And they'll tell you about which neurons and glia are being affected. And again, you can follow the time course. Um, just near, nearly finished with the, uh, the webinar, but just um, this illustrates something quite interesting here. So this is using magnetic resonance spectroscopy, and it just shows how subtle and discrete the uh, deficit is. So this was a, a discrete in myoinositol, so it's just one part of the spectrum, and it's only in one part of the brain. Um, so this is what a normal spectrum looks like. So this part of the brain was unaffected. This one, you can see it missing, which goes to also illustrate when you're doing the in vitro work, you need to, to some extent, it's difficult to catch everything. Alternatively, you need to know what you're looking for or what to expect. And the same with the functional responses and measurements in vivo as well. Um, which probably explains why histopathology is still the gold standard, where you would um, look at uh, sections through various um, parts of the brain to look for um, damage to neurons. So it's been a, quite a quick uh, whistle-stop tour. It's quite a big topic, but basically, in summary, numerous drugs, chemicals, and heavy metals cause adverse effects on the central and peripheral nervous system, some of them resulting in permanent damage. These effects are caused by a range of direct and indirect mechanisms. And the range of in silico, in vitro, in vivo, and post-mortem histological techniques to detect and evaluate this toxicity prior to human exposure. I'd just like to thank former colleagues in AstraZeneca and also Annette Allen, who did the ERG measurements, um, and Rob Lewis Lucas at the University of Manchester. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Will. That was a great talk. Next up is Julie Eakins. Thank you, Julie. You'll um, please start your presentation. Thank you very much, Claire, for the introduction. Uh, I'd also like to thank the organisers for inviting me here today. So the aim of this presentation is to describe a number of in vitro approaches to identify compounds which interfere with mitochondrial function and why we think that they're important. And obviously, uh, Will's just alluded to one of the reasons. Uh, in order to achieve this, I'll give a brief introduction. If I can, she says. There we go. Sorry about that. I will give a brief introduction to the area of mitochondrial toxicity and biology and describe some of the assays that we've been utilising. Uh, they include the simple cytotoxicity assays, 
and they will include some of the more complex assays using the Agilent Seahorse XFE Flux Analyzer. I will also introduce an assay which has been developed especially for the antimicrobial sector. And using these assays, I will demonstrate how it is possible to not only enhance the prediction of mitochondrial toxicity, but also gain an insight into possible mechanisms. And finally, I will have a quick look at drug-induced liver toxicity and the role of mitochondria in that. This is one of the most frequent sources of compound attrition in both early and late stage drug attrition. So as you may already be aware, mitochondria are responsible for a variety of cellular functions, the major function being the production of over 95% of ATP via a process known as oxidative phosphorylation or OxFOS. And this is basically the breakdown of fuel sources such as glucose, protein and fat in the presence of oxygen to ultimately form water, carbon dioxide and ATP. And this uses a series of enzymes and complexes known as the electron transport chain or ETC. However, they're also involved in a number of other complex uh, cellular functions such as apoptosis, calcium flux homeostasis, fatty acid metabolism, etc. Now, mitochondrial dysfunction has been evidenced by the fact that numerous diseases and metabolic disorders have been associated with mutations in either mitochondrial DNA or nuclear DNA, which are code for mitochondrial proteins. And examples of these are Lee syndrome and uh, Leber's hereditary optic neuropathy. And there's growing evidence that mitochondrial dysfunction is associated with both dementia and neurodegenerative disorders. This has been demonstrated by Cannon and et al, who described the development of a preclinical model of Parkinson's using the well-documented complex one inhibitor, rotenome. So mitochondrial toxicity has been considered an important mechanism for a number of years and implicated in a number of high profile withdrawals from the market, such as triglitazone, tolcopone and cerivastatin, along with a number of black box warnings has been implicated in multiple organ toxicities, including those by antibacterials, and is also implicated in toxicities such as liver, cardiac and kidney, as well as a potential contributor to idiosyncratic drug-induced liver injury, or DILI. Why is this important to the antimicrobial research area? Well, not only as we've mentioned, as Will's mentioned that it's been implicated in neurotoxicity, but recently reviewed by Andre and Tulkins, many antibiotics have been linked with DILI. So trovofloxin was withdrawn in 1999 and telithromycin was issued black box warnings and was also voluntarily withdrawn from the US market back in the 2000s. And in a recent publication by Jeff Woodhead et al back in 2019, they showed that both telithromycin and at clarithromycin were associated with inhibition of mitochondrial respiration. And this is going to be covered in more detail in the next presentation by Paul. One of the unique features of mitochondria is that they can actually replicate by themselves independently of cellular replication in a process known as mitochondrial biogenesis. This is a process by which mitochondrial mass can be increased due to increased ATP demand and they contain their own genome encoding 13 essential proteins which form part of the ETC. These proteins also include the machinery for that replication to take place. And the remaining proteins are encoded by nuclear DNA and synthesized in the sotosol and post-translationally imported into the mitochondria. Many anti-infectives target viral and bacterial DNA, DNA replication or protein synthesis. And there is some degree of homology between this and mitochondrial DNA replication. Thus a potential for these therapies to interfere with mammalian cell health. Examples of these are the antibiotics linizolid and chloramphenicol in which bone marrow suppression has been associated with inhibition of mitochondrial biogenesis. And the early nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors were associated with lactic acidosis 
liver dystrophy and liver failure. All this implies that the early detection of compounds which affect mitochondrial function would be beneficial in drug discovery. And as such, a number of these approaches have been developed, which can be incorporated. And I will present some of the typical approaches now in more detail. Some of which, as I say, have been spe specifically developed for anti-infectives. So the first and the simplest of the assays is the glue-gal assay. This was uh, first described back in 2007 by Maraquin. And in this assay, the cytotoxicity of the compound is determined under two different culture conditions, either glucose or galactose. Under standard laboratory conditions, it is common to culture cells in moderate to high glucose media. And when using transformed cells, such as HEP-G2s, this, this encourages the cells to rely on glycolysis for their energy demand. And this is independent of mitochondria, and this is known as the Crabtree effect. And by exchanging the media to one containing galactose, this forces the cells to rely on mitochondrial oxphos to supply ATP, rendering them more susceptible to mitochondrial toxicants. So in the glue gal assay, the test compound, as I say, is dosed in media containing high glucose or galactose, and following 24 hours, incubation cytotoxicity is assessed using such as cellular ATP or the MTT assay. Using a reference set of compounds we established that if a compound is greater than threefold more toxic under galactose conditions this implies that a compound is a mitochondrial toxicant. An example of which is shown here in which the cytotoxicity of entacapone is 10 times greater than that in the, sorry, the cytotoxicity of entacapone in galactose is 10 times more toxic than that in glucose. We can also assess mitochondrial health using high content imaging to determine the effects of compound on the mitochondrial membrane potential, the MMP. In these assays, you can use a number of different dyes, such as rhodamine or TMRE. These are potentiometric dyes which are sequestered into the mitochondria when there is an active mitochondrial MMP. So when this happens, you get the dye taken up and we can measure that at the cellular level. In the example shown here, etg 2 cells were dosed with either vehicle control or 5 nanomol nanomolar rotenone for 24 hours and using high content imaging determine the cell count by using Hirsch and the MMP dye rhodamine 123. In the upper panel, you can see that the cells are stained for both nuclei, the blue color, and associated with these is the mitochondrial rhodamine staining, in this instance, green. With five nanomolar rotenone in the lower panel, there is no cell loss, as you can see. However, the associated rhodamine signal is much reduced, indicating loss of MMP. As you can also see, the a table with some reference compounds. And using this high content imaging approach, we established that a twofold shift between MMP and cell count loss resulted in the successful identification of the majority of the compounds. The next and more complicated assay looks at the direct effects of compounds on mitochondrial function. I will give a brief introduction to the mitochondrial stress test assay. As mentioned previously, this uses the XFE96 flux analyzer, which uses cartridges with solid state sensors to simultaneously measure oxygen and pH. This allows the measurement of oxygen consumption rate, OCAR, and extracellular acidification rate, ECAR, in real time, a determinant of oxphos and glycolysis, respectively. Before I proceed, I will quickly explain the terminology in a little more detail. So OCR is a measurement of extracellular oxygen content. And as mentioned earlier, oxygen is required during oxphos process. Thus, a decrease in the rate indicate, indicates reduced mitochondrial respiration. Although increases in OCAR can also be seen with a class of compounds known as uncouplers. ECAR is a measurement of extracellular pH. 
the dominant source of hydrogen ions is lactate, hence an increase in ECAR is deemed as an increase in glycolysis. And this is seen when mitochondrial respiration is inhibited and is an adaptive response to the reduced ATP formed via oxphos. And the final term is the reserve capacity. And this is the ability of the cell to respond to an increase in energy demand. A reduction in this feature indicates mitochondrial dysfunction and demonstrates how close to the bioenergetic limit the cells are. In order to generate these measurements, we use the four injection port systems on the Seahorse cartridges to sequentially add our test compound and selected inhibitors to the cells to determine the basal OCAR, ECAR, maximum respiration rate reserve capacity. And we can also look at ATP linked respiration, proton leak and non-mitochondrial respiration. Initially, four measurements of OCAR and ECAR are taken to determine the baseline and then test compound is injected directly onto the cells and OCAR and ECAR is measured. And this determines the basal effects. The stress test is then performed by sequentially injecting oligomycin, FCCP, and finally rotin rotenone and antimycin A. And these are known inhibitors of the ETC. Injection 2 delivers the oligomycin, a known inhibitor of ATP synthase, also known as complex 5 of the ETC, which is responsible for the phosphorylation of ADP. By inhibiting this complex, this prevents the ETC from functioning and subsequently a decrease in OCAR is reserved and this allows the determination of ATP coupled respiration. Injection 3 delivers FCCP which is a mitochondrial membrane uncoupling agent. This allows the free movement of the ETC. It does not generate ATP since complex 5 has already been inhibited and consequently, this results in the maximum ETC activity and allows the detection of the cellular maximal OCAR and the reserve capacity. Injection 4 delivers the addition of rotenone and antimycin A, abolishing the ETC. And by blocking both complexes, this inhibits all mitochondrial oxygen consumption rate and provides the degree of non-mitochondrial respiration due to oxygen requiring enzymes which are not mitochondrial and this allows the calculation of proton leak. So using this uh, stress test this generates bioenergetic profiles i.e changes in the OCAR reserve capacity and ECAR and this allows the identification of potential mechanisms. Here we have some pictorial representations of how we would normally expect these bioenergetic profiles to look like for some mitochondrial toxicants. So in the upper left diagram is what we would expect an inhibitor of the ETC to look like, such as antimycin A. Inhibition of ETC will decrease both OCAR and reserve capacity with an increase in ECAR. Whilst compounds which uncouple oxidation and phosphorylation the lower left diagram, such as 2,4-dinitrophenol, an increase in OCAR and a compensatory increase in ECAR would be expected, with no discernible effects on reserve capacity, as the cells will already be at maximal respiration. For ATP synthase inhibitors, the upper right diagram, such as oligomycin, we would expect, like the ETC inhibitor, a decrease in OCAR, with the concomitant increase in ECAR. However, we would not expect any effects on reserve capacity as this feature is independent of ATP synthase activity. And with general cytotoxic, cytotoxic compounds such as verapamil, we would expect a decrease in all three features. Using these blueprints, we were able to assign unknown compounds with potential mechanisms of action. And in 2016, we published our findings in which used a reference set of over 70 compounds all compounds were tested to the limit of solubility and covering a range of mechanisms, although, as you can see, they were predominantly ETC inhibitors and uncouplers. We analysed the bioenergetic profiles of the complete compound set using an unbiased approach. And whilst not definitive, you can see there is some concordance between the actual and predictive mechanisms. However, we did also detect a few uh, false positive compounds, 
And as the compounds have been tested to maximum solubility, we looked at ways of trying to improve sensitivity and specificity. So therefore, for both the glue gal and the seahorse assays, we looked at the effect of normalizing the data to human plasma concentration at Cmax. In order to achieve this, we took 59 drugs and chemicals, all with known human Cmax exposure data. This was 27 known positive compounds covering different mechanisms and 32 negatives, either with toxicity associated but no known mitochondrial component or no known toxic liability at all. And when we normalised the data to 100 times Cmax for the seahorse or with the combination of the threefold shift I described earlier for the glue gal assay as well as the 100 times Cmax, both of these assays showed no false positive compounds and as such gave 100% specificity. The seahorse assay correctly identified 21 of the known positive mitochondrial toxicants and the glue gal, however, demonstrated a lower sensitivity at 41%. But by combining the outcome from both assays, the sensitivity came to over 81% and the accuracy of this approach increased to over 91%. Following on from the seahorse assay, we have the permeabilized cell ETC complex assay, again using the XFE96 flux analyzer. The aim of this is to gain a further understanding of the mechanism of toxicity for ETC inhibitors. The assays performed in a single well involves, as suggested, the permeabilization of the cells, in this case HEPG2 cells, and looks at the recovery of oxygen consumption inhibition. The cells are initially assessed in the presence of pyruvate and melate, which are the uh, substrates for complex one, and OCAR is determined. If in the presence of the compound OCAR is inhibited, this indicates an inhibitor of either complex one, three, or four, no inhibition of OCAR, however, still remains the potential to be a complex two inhibitor. Rotenone is then added to block complex one and any reverse electron transport and succinate, the substrate for complex two. Now, if OCAR recovers to vehicle, this shows that complex one was inhibited. If no recovery is seen, this suggests this is either complex three or four. If inhibition is seen, which was not present, before the addition of succinate, and this identifies complex two inhibitors. Finally, if in the presence of the ascorbate and TMPD, the, with antimycin to block complex three, if recovery is seen, this indicates complex three inhibition, with continued OCAR inhibition indicating complex four. And again, we have some example data generated using compounds with clearly defined mechanisms of inhibition. In panel A, the complex one inhibitor, rotenone, inhibit, inhibits pyruvate respiration, but as expected, recovery of OCAR was seen with the complex two substrate succinate. Panel B shows the effect of thiofluzamide, an inhibitor of complex two, in which we see only inhibition of succinate, succinate respiration. This is an important aspect as it allows differentiation of the complex signals. And recovery is observed with a score bait addition. Panel C shows the response to antimycin A, the complex three inhibitor. In this example, we see inhibition in the presence of both pyruvate and succinate substrates and show recovery with a score bait. Panel D is sodium azide, the complex four inhibitor, in which we see inhibition of all three substrates, i.e. no recovery. And finally, we have the negative control betaine in which no inhibition was seen. <clears throat> Using a set of reference compounds with literature defined modes of action reported to inhibit single complexes of the ETC, we assess these in both the stress test and the permeabilized cell assay. Using the stress test, all of the compounds were identified as having some mitochondrial effects. But what may be apparent from this data is that whilst the majority of the complex one, three and four inhibitors were correctly class classified, only one of the complex two inhibitors was assigned the correct mechanism. <clears throat> Although the complex two inhibitors were identified as mitochondrial toxicants in the stress test, 
the mechanisms are difficult to detect in intact cells, possibly due to complex one preference in high substrate environments. <coughs> However, using the permeabilized cell assay, the majority of the compounds were correctly identified. By combining the stress test and the permeabilized cell assay, we can distinguish between four and five. Using a set of reference compounds with literature defined modes of action reported, oh, sorry, we've recently assessed a further reference set of compounds uh, consisting of 52 drugs, which we tested up to 100 times total plasma C max, 23 positive mitochondrial toxicants, and we had 29 negatives, of which only four of those had no reported organ toxicity. This compound set included the antibiotics nitrofurotoan, known, known in patotoxin, and streptomycin, with which we had no known organ toxicity associated, and these have been highlighted in the box. Sorry, they're very small to see. As you can see here once again, neither the glue gal nor the stress test identified false positives, confirming the findings of our earlier publication. Although this is a different set of compounds, once again, the stress test gave the highest sensitivity as previous. Uh, the MMP appears to be the least specific with se seven false positives. However, this data set included a number of cytotoxic compounds, and it's possible that we may be detecting cells undergoing apoptosis or indirect mitochondrial responses. As I say, I've highlighted the two antimicrobials, and using this approach, we have identified nitrofurantoin as a mitochondrial toxicant. These assays that I've already described will show direct effects on mitochondrial function. And I've shown a number of approaches. However, they are short duration from less than one hour for the seahorse assay to 24 hours for the glue gal and MMP assay. However, as I mentioned earlier, antimicrobials have the potential to interfere with mitochondrial replication, which occurs over several days. As such, the mitochondrial biogenesis assay has been as a prolonged exposure of one week with a repeat dosing on day four. This allows a minimum of two to three cell cycles. So although mitochondria can replicate independently, this does ensure mitochondrial replication. In this assay, we again use eye content imaging technology. We measure nuclei for cell count. We use succinate di dehydrogenase, complex two, which is a nuclear only encoded protein marker. And we use sub subunit one of complex four, which is a wholly mitochondrial encoded protein. And we compare the two proteins and use cell count to determine cell loss. As can be seen from this table, there are a number of antimicrobials known to inhibit mitochondrial biogenesis, and the mechanisms are diverse, many targeting protein synthesis, such as linezolid, or DNA replication, such as the NRTIs. Although predominantly antimicrobials are associated with this toxicity, some anti-cancer agents, such as doxorubicin, has also been shown to interfere with DNA replication by a mitochondrial DNA mutations. As you can see in this image, this shows the effect of dosing HEP-G2 cells for one week with 100 micromolar chloramphenicol. The box to the left shows the Hirsch staining, demonstrating there is very little cell loss. However, the panel directly next to this shows the staining for the subunit 1 COX-1 protein. And as can be clearly seen, there is no visible staining here, although there is still plenty of SDH staining evidence in the next panel. This shows that the nuclear DNA replication is not affected and the cell cycle is not affected. However, mitochondrial DNA replication or protein synthesis has been inhibited by this compound, which would result in a defective ETC. And here we show chloramphenicol dose-dependent decrease in COX-1 expression compared to succinate dehydrogenase. <clears throat> 
In the table below, there are a number of other compounds that we have looked at with the different targets covering the large bacterial 50S ribosomal down to the 30S ribosomal subunit, all of which was shown positive in this assay. As mentioned earlier, drug induced, uh, sorry, as mentioned earlier, mitochondrial toxicity has been implicated in a number of drug withdrawals. DIL is the most common cause of preclinical and clinical and post marketing attrition. Based on this, we assessed a number of known hepatotoxic DILI compounds and non DILI compounds, again using the GluGal, MMP, and the mitochondrial stress test. The boxes highlighted in red are compounds which resulted in a positive signal in any of the assays. The boxes in yellow show the sensitivity and specificity for each assay. And once again, as shown previously, the glue, gal and stress test identified no, po no false positive compounds. The stress test alone identified that 39% of the DILI compounds had a mitochondrial liability. And when we combined both the glue, gal and the CORS assays, as we'd seen previously, this increased to 42%. Uh, this was because one compound, ritonavir, was identified in the glue, gal but not the seahorse assay. This data suggests that mitochondrial toxicity is involved in over 40% of DILI compounds. And this is supported in the recent Pfizer paper in which Rana published similar findings. Where our data set and that of the Rana publication match, we saw that 19 of the DILI compounds and eight of the non-DILI compounds had the same mitochondrial call. And finally, I would like to summarise the findings I've presented here today. Early discovery screening for mitochondrial toxicants would be beneficial and could be for, performed using a number of different in vitro approaches. Both the MMP and the glue gal assays are amenable to high throughput 384 well format, unlike the XF flux analyzer based assays. And the glue gal and the flux analyzer Either, sorry, the glue gal and the seahorse both have shown high specificity and sensitivity. The stress test does show the highest sensitivity towards mitochondrial toxicants, and using a combination of both the stress test and the permeable cell assays can provide insights into possible modes of action. The stress test can indicate if a compound is a mitochondrial toxicant and can also indicate potential mechanism which can then be confirmed by the permeabilized cell assay, which can be used to determine ETC inhibition and associated complex inhibition. The mitochondrial biogenesis assay has been developed to assess the potential of antimicrobials specifically targeting bacterial and viral replication. The mechanism of action information could be useful, especially during early drug discovery, aiding chemical selection, especially when off target. Uh, is implicated. And we have shown that DILI prediction using mitochondrial toxicity as a single mechanism with 100% specificity and 42% sensitivity when combining the glue, gal and stress test, illustrating the importance of mitochondrial liabilities in DILI. Hopefully, we've demonstrated that this in vitro toolbox approach is valuable in predicting mitochondrial toxicity potential and mitigating this risk in an organ toxicity. And although these are generic assays, I hope I've shown also that these are very useful for the antimicrobial sector. And finally, I'd like to say thank you. I couldn't have generated all this work on my own. I've had help and support by Paul, Chris, Andrea, Zakia and Lawrence. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Julie, and for soldiering through with a tickly cough. <laughs> much appreciated. Um, so now we move on to um, Paul Watkins. Um, please start your presentation. Thank you. Yes, hi. Well, glad to be part of this great uh, presentation. Try to click again. Okay. Um, I chair the Scientific Advisory Committee for the DILI-SIM initiative, which I'll be talking about. Although I did, I no longer have equity or personal financial stake in either the spin-off company DILI-SIM Services 
or the parent company simulations plus. So I'm gonna talk about um, the issue of antibiotics and drug-induced liver injury, starting with approved antibiotics. Then I'm gonna tell you about the Dilly-SIM initiative and uh, its role, increasing role in antibiotic development, and then give you some conclusions. There are a number of registries worldwide that find patients who've had clinically important liver reactions to any drug. And in the United States, it is the US Drug-Induced Liver Injury Network, or DILIN, which has been around for more than a decade and a half. Uh, these are the current uh, clinical sites that are currently finding and enrolling patients in a registry and getting their dear, uh, DNA and serum and urine for biomarker discovery. And in the Dillon network, okay, um, this is a publication that came out a few years back. There are now about twice as many cases, but the message is the same, that antimicrobials are by far the therapeutic class that is most implicated in causing clinically important drug-induced liver injury. You can see out of the 900 cases, uh, over 400 are actually due to antimicrobials. And um, the reason this is true is probably multifactorial. Obviously, the denominator of exposure to antimicrobials is obviously very great. So even a small risk can lead to uh, cases uh, you know, being seen. Also, of course, there are few drugs that are given in gram, multigram quantities. And we know uh, dose is important even for the more rare what are called idiosyncratic reactions. And then other people point to things like altering the gut microbiome as possibly uh, uh, being a risk factor for DILI. But regardless, uh, it, it is far and away the major class of uh, drugs that cause drug-induced liver injury. And that's also the case in the European and the Spanish South American and uh, um, uh, drug-induced liver injury network. Now, if you look at the actual drugs that um, are the top 10, yeah, you can see that of the top 10 drugs implicated as causes of drug-induced liver injury, the top nine are actually all antibiotics with amoxicillin clavulane, uh, augmentin being number one, uh, presumably because of the very large denominator uh, of exposure to this generic and inexpensive uh, drug. Isoniazid, nitrofurantoin, sulfamethoxazole, trimethoprim, or Bactrim, minocycline. Now, now we start getting to drugs that we would generally regard as being safe for the liver, including uh, cephalosporin, uh, zithromycin, ciprofloxacin, levofloxacin, obviously drugs that are relatively safe, uh, antibiotics relatively safe for the liver, but nonetheless have been judged by the experts in our network as causing rare, uh, clinically important liver injury. So the upshot of this is that, uh, you know, most antibiotics on the market have some degree of liver safety issues. Um, and therefore, liver safety is likely to be a focus for the FDA and other regulatory agencies, the EMA, for instance, uh, with any new antibiotic candidate. So now I'm going to move on to the DILISIM initiative and its role in antibiotic development. So I have directed for uh, over a decade the University of North Carolina's Institute for Drug Safety Sciences, and we collaborate with uh, the drug development programs and also, of course, the U.S. Drug-Induced Liver Injury Network to study patients who have actually experienced liver reactions to drugs. And then we have a variety of in vitro cellular systems to uh, begin to look at mechanisms and also some mouse models. But what I'm here to talk about today is the DILISIM initiative 
which is now uh, entering its second decade of existence. This is a public-private partnership that actually was initiated uh, by the Food and Drug Administration with a grant from the FDA that has been uh, traditionally very supportive of this initiative, including supporting uh, modelers embedded in the, um, in the group doing this modeling through what they call an ARES fellowship. And these are some of the, the drugs, or some of the companies currently supporting this initiative. Over the last decade, uh, 17 of the top 20 pharmaceutical companies have provided data and financial support to keep this uh, initiative going. And this develops what's called a quantitative systems toxicology model for drug-induced liver injury. And the definition of quantitative systems toxicology, or a definition, is the use of differential equations to recapitulate relevant pathways whereby drugs and other chemicals can cause stress and death to cells, tissues, and organs. So what has been done over the last decade uh, with our partners um, is to build mechanistic modules using differential equations for various um, pathways and processes in the liver relevant to drug-induced liver injury. And then in the process of doing that, it becomes clear where data gaps exist or where um, the literature is, is contradictory uh, and so it really guides the research agenda and the companies also then supported performing experiments to fill in the knowledge gaps. For instance, uh, Pfizer and Yvonne Will, when she was there, um, really helped a lot with providing data for the modeling of the mitochondria and the effects of drugs on mitochondria. Then second, the modules are integrated with the outcome of hepatocyte death and release and clearance of traditional, but also now more novel serum biomarkers. And then in the model, the parameters are varied to create uh, simulated populations. That is to create interpatient heterogeneity that exists due to genetic variation and also non-genetic factors uh, such as disease or drug-drug interactions. And then finally, the model was refined through incorporating data obtained from successive exemplar drugs. Some of the data came from publications, but a lot of it came from the partners and in the initiative, their own experience with drugs that had discordant preclinical uh, safety testing and clinical uh, results. And um, what's shown on the next slide, which I hope will come up, is a 30,000 foot view of um, the actual model. And you can see at the top, obviously, drug metabolism dis uh, uh, distribution, uh, reactive metabolites, reactive oxygen species, lipotoxicity. There's biliary uh, cell toxicity. Um, I won't be talking about that today. Um, then you can see mitochondrial dysfunction, intracellular bile acids, with the outcome being liver cell death and release of, into serum of biomarkers, but also built in the model is regeneration of the liver in response to liver cell death. And also there's an innate immune component shown at the bottom. And you can see the outcome is predicting the time dependent um, release and values of serum biomarkers. And what has become clear is that three processes seem to account for the majority of, of drug and uh, of dose dependent toxicity from drugs, toxicity to the liver. And that's reactive oxygen species or oxidative stress, alterations in intracellular bile acids particularly, of course, the accumulation of toxic bile acids in liver cells. And then um, mitochondrial dysfunction or toxicity, which we just heard about from Julie. I'll wait for that to come on. There we go. And then leading to release uh, 
um, and the actual prediction of the time dependent change in traditional and novel biomarkers in serum. And what I'll be showing today is the uh, traditional most sensitive measure of hepatocellular toxicity or liver toxicity, alanine, alanine aminotransferase or ALT. So the way this is done is you have to um, model the exposure outside and inside the liver cell of drugs through um, physiologically based pharmacokinetic modeling or other data such as may be available from mass balance uh, studies. And then the drug and um, if relevant major metabolites are subjected to three separate assays. One is the ability of the drugs to inhibit relevant bile acid transporters, particularly bile salt excretory pump, but also efflux transporters, MRP3, MRP4. And this has been traditionally uh, done, uh, the, the preferred uh, vendor for this has been Salvo that has provided most of the data to date in terms of a uh, modeling bile acid homeostasis. Mitochondrial respiration and react reactive oxygen generation, uh, the preferred provider has been Ciprotex, as Julie just uh, pointed out, using the seahorse instrument and uh, high content imaging of reactive oxygen species uh, in living uh, liver cells or uh, HEPG2 cells currently uh, moving towards spheroids of HEPA-RG cells to incorporate metabolic capabilities. And then finally, um, uh, putting in the uh, variation in parameters, what's called simulation populations or SIMPOPs, uh, into the model to generate interpatient heterogeneity. There are roughly 300 individuals that have been modeled with varying um, parameters in the model uh, that have been based largely on literature data or company data, but also over time uh, changing the parameters to fit the actual data in real populations. And after all this information is put into the model, you simply let it run and you will get uh, a simulated frequency and severity of liver injury. In this case, we'll be talking about the time dependent uh, increase in serum ALT. So the first example, which you've already heard about, is solithromycin. I think anybody in antibiotic development knows the story of solithromycin. It was an antibiotic that was shown to be effective in treating community-acquired pneumonia. It did cause, clearly, ALT elevations in clinical trials, and it was more than comparator, moxifloxacin. And there was concern raised um, by the FDA about the, the fact that it was structurally very similar to tolithromycin, which um, after it was approved caused, although extremely rare, but unfortunately severe liver injury in at least one in 20,000 treated patients. So an obvious question regulators had was, does tolithromycin have the liver safety problems that tolithromycin or Ketec did. Oops, sorry. So you can see that the reason for concern, if you look at solithromycin and tolithromycin structures, you have to squint to begin to see, oh, there's a fluoride here, there's a amino group here, but certainly at first glance, they look awfully similar. But of course, um, in the larger macrolide class, So I will hit again. They're, they're all actually very structurally similar. Um, obviously, the macrolid group is common to all of them. I've shown here erythromycin, clarithromycin, azithromycin. And so um, Sempra, the company that made solithromycin, said to the Dilysim team, well, please model uh, you know, the uh, macrolid antibiotics and also these ketolides, both solithromycin and tolithromycin to see sort of what comes out of this modeling. Azithromycin was modeled later uh, and is available in the public domain. So again, those drugs were um, uh, went through the system of determining uh, exposure 
outside and inside liver cells as a function of the dosing regimen, both dose, timing of dosing and duration. And then they went through the three assays shown here and then were put into the simulated population and the uh, simulated frequency and severity of liver injury was predicted. So for slithromycin, um, there were two regimens in the NDA submission. There was an all oral and an IV to oral, and there was 5.4% incidence of ALT elevations greater than three times the upper limit of normal actually observed in the clinical trial with uh, oral only. And this was almost double or 9.1% in the IV to oral. There was more uh, exposure in the IV to oral. Um, and um, the simulated value was 3.9% for the oral and 6% for the IV to oral. So it underpredicted, but actually, if you went back and looked at the subpopulation that started treatment with normal serum ALT, and the modeling is a normal, uh, it starts out with the assumption that ALT is normal, it was actually very close, remarkably close, 3.2% and 5.5%. And I might say, this is true prediction. A lot of times modelers will say that the model predicted, and what they really mean is that they varied the parameters in the model to fit the data. This is not fitting the data. This is true prediction based on the data that was put into the model. Now with Solith, uh, if I hit it again, so there we go. So for erythromycin, observed and simulated incidence of ALT elevations was lower and very similar for erythromycin and clarithromycin relative to uh, the slightly lower observed incidence of ALT elevations in the clinical trials. And then interestingly, with telithromycin, the um, Dilisem predicted none of the 300 patients would have experienced the simulated patients would have had experience in ALT greater than three times the upper limit of normal. Um, if they did predict lower levels of elevations, however, and interestingly, KeyTech itself had a vanishingly small incidence of ALT elevations greater than three times the upper limit of normal. Um, so this, the Lisa modeling did not predict uh, the uh, rare idiosyncratic toxicity of tolithromycin. So in that sense, the modeling wasn't, wasn't helpful to Sempra. On the other hand, and oh, just the conclusion, Dilisem did predict the incidence of elevations in serum ALT across this antibiotic class. However, um, something was helpful and was actually presented at the uh, FDA advisory committee. And that's once you've modeled a drug like solithromycin and the other macrolid antibiotics, you can then look at the uh, incidence and analyze the mechanism by sequentially just shutting off in the model each of the three processes, bile acid transporter inhibition, mitochondrial respiration, reactive oxygen generation, um, and actually see what it does to the, the predicted incidence and therefore infer what are the major um, processes contributing to the ALT elevations. And when that was done with solithromycin, the predominant mechanism was interfering with mitochondrial respiration. In fact, the results were identical to clarithromycin. But surprisingly, although clarithromycin and erythromycin have very similar structures, as I showed you, the predominant mechanisms were not the same. It was inhibition of bile acid transporter inhibition that was accounting for the ALT elevations simulated in Dilisim with erythromycin, and it was inhibition in mitochondrial respiration for, for clarithromycin, with no evidence of that occurring with erythromycin. And then when um, Ketec or tolithromycin was put in, it, the predominant mechanism, because there were ALT elevations that occurred, they just didn't go over three times the upper limit of normal, was inhibition of transporters, 
that is alterations in bile acid homeostasis with no effect on mitochondrial respiration. Somewhat remarkable that with such similar uh, structures that there would be such a difference. So this was presented um, actually by me at the FDA advisory committee saying, um, look, the effects of these drugs at the level of the hepatocyte are not similar. And we believe, and it's a current thought, that you don't get liver toxicity, even idiosyncratic toxicity, without some level of stress at the, at the hepatocyte. And the mechanisms of stress are entirely different between these two molecules. And as you may know, the advisory committee narrowly uh, voted to approve solithromycin, but the FDA uh, demanded a larger, much larger clinical trial, which has never been conducted. So moving on, should have moved, try again. So um, the knowledge that mitochondrial inhibition is the major mechanism with solithromycin provided an explanation for a phenomena during treatment with uh, solithromycin, which is actually seen in many instances of drug-induced liver injury, which is called adaptation. And that's because when you stress mitochondrial function, the uh, liver cells respond by creating more mitochondria, as Julie said, mitochondrial uh, replication and regeneration. And this is actually a study in mouse hepatocytes showing that as you treat with increasing doses of rotenone, you get an increase in the proteins, the mitochondrial proteins. That is, you get increased mitogenesis to respond to uh, the stress. So in the case of solithromycin, uh, during treatment, there were patients who spiked ALT but were continued on treatment. And many of them had their, liver, their serum ALT fall despite continuing treatment. And that is called adaptation. The liver is adapting, in this case, very likely due to um, mitogenesis. Now, in the simulation results without considering mitogenesis, the liver enzymes continue to go up until you reach some sort of homeostasis between regeneration and cell death, which does occur. When uh, mitogenesis was put into the model, actually fitting the data from solithromycin, but has since been able to predict adaptation from other antibiotics and other drugs, you see a, a phenomenon very similar to what was actually observed, where mitogenesis reduces um, the actual uh, ALTs over time. And that uh, turns out, knowing that uh, interference with mitochondria is the major mechanism, uh, appears to pro provide insight into patient risk factors. And this is something that the um, FDA's antimicrobial division uh, has been quite interested in. This actually isn't solithromycin. It's another drug that I don't have permission to talk about that caused very minor ALT elevations in a subset of patients, just showing plasma ALT as a function of time. But in a drug interaction study, when they treated with drug X and then just looked at a probe of metformin, they saw this in very substantial spike in one of the, the patients. This is simulated data, but the data is very similar to what they saw. So they asked the Dilly-Sim team to see if they could account for this. And sure enough, they could. Now, if patients are already on metformin, uh, and metformin itself causes very trivial ALT elevations, there is uh, mitogenesis already so that the effect is much less pronounced. So this is an effect of starting metformin treatment. And this is really the open up avenue of you know, thinking what other drugs uh, interfere with mitochondrial respiration and uh, it might you know, have a sudden direct effect and cause ALT elevations. And actually in the solithromycin study, patients, some patients were receiving metformin and there's actually going to be a presentation at the American Society of Clinical Pharmacology and Therapeutics by Kung Hee Yang uh, that's going to talk about the, the modeling and, and uh, clinical uh, observations that were observed in that trial. Um, I don't have permission to talk about that. The other issue, of course, is what if mitochondrial um, mitogenesis is inhibited, as we heard from Julie, 
what effect would that have on uh, the incidence or susceptibility to significant ALT? And all this can be modeled. So uh, um, the predominant mechanisms underlying dose-dependent hepatotoxicity uh, can vary within a class and clearly uh, did vary uh, in model predictions in the macrolid class. Despite structural similarity, the effects of silythromycin on the liver were not predicted to be the same as tolithromycin. And knowing the major mechanism that's causing DILI can identify patient risk factors. And if you want to know more about this, this is the manuscript that actually Julie also pointed to, where azithromycin modeling is also included. So the, my last example is this um, antibiotic that was in development for multidrug resistant bacteria. Um, Dose-dependent ALT elevations were observed in a phase one clinical trial, and they came to the team and said, um, you know, what dosing regimen could we use that you would predict would not cause ALT elevations, or at least would minimize ALT elevations, because they wanted to then see whether further development of this drug would be practical. Because once you have ALT elevations, particularly ALT elevations at a greater rate than your comparator, you are then thrown into the difficult position of trying to prove a negative, prove you don't have a problem. This is what happened with silythromycin, for instance. So again, the um, data was collected. Uh, what did, you know, the data that was available. I'm pretty sure Salvo and Ciprotex uh, got the data for this. It was put in the model to predict the incidence and severity. And I'll show you the manuscript where this uh, in a minute, in case you want to know more about that. So varying the, the pharmacokinetics was obviously the issue in dosing regimens. And what is just sort of summarized here is the predicted incidence of ALT elevation in the simulated population of 300, shown in the green boxes, uh, was zero until they went to the 200, to, you know, two gram dose. And so the question was then, the company said, well, um, you know, can we get an effective drug if we keep a dose in you know, 1,000 milligrams or less? Uh, to my knowledge, this has not been tested clinically um, you know, but this is the kind of information that Dilisim is is uh, getting for antibiotics that are currently in development. And um, I can say it appears to be useful in getting venture capital, if nothing else. You know, I think it's part of the weight of evidence that would support um, that there won't be an ALT cloud of concern, you know, in development. Um, although, again, this is, you know, work in progress. So, uh, and this is the, uh, the uh, manuscript that discusses this. So in conclusion, you know, DELISA modeling, I think, is already having a significant impact on decision-making and antibiotic development. And uh, more importantly, I think it's an example how quantitative system pharmacology, QSP, and quantitative systems toxicology, QST, should revolutionize drug development. And I believe this is going to occur in the near future. So in closing, I'll just show the Dillysim team, a group picture of most of them that was taken uh, about a year ago. Brett Howell in the center is the president and Scott Seiler is the chief uh, scientific officer, very remarkable people. And it's a very remarkable uh, team. So with that, I will close and uh, allow us to go into the question and answer period. Thank you very much, Paul. That was really interesting. And um, so we'll now start the Q&A session. As a quick reminder for the audience, you can submit your questions as shown on this slide. Please include the name of the speaker you're addressing your question to, and we will do our best to respond to as many questions as possible during the time left. Julie and Will, can I ask you to put your cameras on as well, please? And Paul, to keep yours on. All right, I got back Thank on you. now. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I'll start with the question I have, um, we've had come in for, for Will. Um, the question is, what is the predictive value of structural neurotoxicity that we see in animals to the likelihood of it occurring in man? Yeah, um, I was impressed with some of the 
sensitivity and specificity data that Julie was showing for the mitochondrial assays, and I don't think that's been matched yet with the um, neurotoxin in vitro assays, but <clears throat> the first papers on it generally focused on one compound at one concentration, and they've gradually improved on that. So the papers you're seeing now from the in vitro neurotox platforms are going, you know, up to six compounds or 20, you know, odd controls and um, negative and positive controls. So people are improving in their uh, predictive uh, data analysis on the assays. So that's a long way of saying I don't have, um, you know, a short answer in terms of what the sensitivity and specificity is, but I definitely know that it's improving all the time. So um, I'm so sure at uh, Supratex they've got some neurotox assays and uh, maybe Julie could uh, provide some answers to that as well. Oh, I wish I could. <laughs> I, I could. I could certainly look into it for you. Um, it's okay. not something that we run here at the UK side. Okay, right. Sorry, Will, could you put your camera on as well? Oh, sorry, sorry, You're well. hiding. <laughs> Thanks, Will, for that answer. Um, Julia, a question for you. Um, so you mentioned that uh, many of your tests are actually conducted to the limit of solubility. And there's a question around that in early projects, obviously solubility can be a bit limited and as the chemistry isn't optimized. Is there anything you can do to allow for this to, to, to be able to really assess the, the mitochondrial risk of a compound? Uh, not really. If we do the best we can. We do do solubility checking as well before we actually dose the cells. We would say that if we don't know any information that it's either maximum solubility or as you've seen from the presentation, 100 times C max would be our preferred as well. And a third option, especially for the seahorse and the glue gal assays, because we've assessed these to as you can tell by quite a number of compounds, we would go at 100 micromolar top concentration. Um, so it does depend very much on compound availability as well, because we understand we do a lot of screening, very early, early screening. So that there are the three. Sorry, Julie. I guess, do you have a capability to look at um, mitochondria that aren't in a cell, I guess, would be the other way of assessing that? Uh, there are options to do that. It's not something we do routinely here. Uh, the easiest way to do that is actually the permeabilized cell assay. We, you can certainly look at isolated mitochondria using seahorse. But as I say, that's not what we would do routinely at uh, Ciprotax. Thank you. Um, and uh, Will, another question for you actually. What is the current regulatory requirement for testing of neurotoxicity before first time in man studies? Yeah, just start by saying I've got a problem with a camera, which seems to... Uh, <laughs> That's why you're hiding. <laughs> um, the regulatory requirements, um, the standard requirements, so for um, from the one-month uh, tox studies in a rodent and non-rodent species, there's a set of um, coronal sections through the brain. I don't know if there's a couple through the spinal cord and through some peripheral nerves as well, uh, retina, etc. Um, so they're, they're the standard um, histo histological tissue set on the nervous system in the two species. And in terms of functional measurements um, in the ICHS 7A guidelines on safety pharmacology, um, you basically just require to do a global assessment of um, neurobehavioral effects using either the functional observational battery or the Irwin test, which is both of which are systematic evaluations of nervous system function. Um, so there's no requirement to do anything specific. The tests that I showed, like rotor rod, beam walking, uh, gait analysis, and then the sensory tests are not required. They would be done if you felt there was a um, potential for um, specific effects on nervous system function, or if you'd, you'd seen some histopathology. Thanks, Will. Uh, and a question for Paul here. Um, have you tested whether AUC or free levels are better predictors in the Delisim models? Yeah, that's a good question. The um, 
there was a, a subgroup um, of scientists from industry that uh, began to look into that. You know, is it the free fraction or is it the you know total fraction? And in terms of the modeling, everything works out better with the total concentration rather than the free concentration. And um, I'm not really sure why that is. Of course, you know, with things like inhibiting VSEP, you're really talking about the concentration inside the cell, um, which is also going to be bound to proteins if it's lipophilic. So I think it's complicated. And, and I think the idea that the real relevant thing is the relative affinity of the drug for a protein versus the target. So for BSEP, for instance. And so, but I can tell you that in terms of the modeling and also in terms of other predictions that other companies like Pfizer have done, it seems that the, the total concentration is more predictive than when you put in the free concentration. Thank you very much. Julie may have a comment too, I don't know. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't get, get that. Well, I just wonder what your thoughts were on free versus uh, bound uh, oh, thank you. inhibitors, yeah, thank for you. instance, of, of mitokinin. Uh, certainly, when we did the um, looking at the sensitivity specificity, we found that the total, um, the total Cmax was more predictive than using uh, the free con concentrations. Mm. It's interesting, right. isn't it? Because because for a lot of more functional off-target effects, you'd often use you know things like HERG you'd look at free. So it's interesting that maybe the different toxicities and mechanisms actually the, the free or bound or have a different analysis. Yeah. Again, I like the idea that it's the relative affinity for the protein versus the target. And also Ciprotex actually measures the intracellular content yeah. contents by mass spec, which is helpful. Obviously, you're not just doing a dose response media to the effects say on mitochondria, but actually can look at the uh, intracellular concentration at least. Yeah. Um, another question uh, for Will. If you were looking to assess the convulsant risk, what in vitro off targets should you be aware of? <laughs> um, quite a few actually, but there's some, uh, one of the most um, implicated ones is GABA A antagonism <clears throat> but there are various other receptors that have been implicated um, there's a good review by Alison Easter et al um, in I think it's drug discovery today from I can't remember what year it was actually probably about 2007 something like that um, that's got a list of the receptors um, that are implicated um, and also another review that has got uh, quite a few of them listed is the uh, Bose et al. Uh, paper in um, Nature Reviews Drug Discovery on secondary pharmacology screening, which has got a proposed panel of 44 receptors, some of which are implicated in seizures. So those are, are two starting points I would point you at. Um, and obviously the strength of association varies between different um, different receptor interactions, but you know, it starts with the strongest at GABA-A antagonism, and, and then it becomes a sort of a weaker association with other receptors. Um, there's also a possibility there could be, um, if you like, um, an additive effect across uh, multiple receptors, because what you're talking about is, is changes in the balance of excitability from inhibitory to excitatory, so you only have to disrupt that, um, if you like, slightly, and you can push uh, neuronal circuits into uh, seizure-like activity. So yeah, those would be my two starting points. Thanks, Well, that's really helpful. Um, another question for Paul. Does the modeling include polypharmacy as a routine? Good question. Not as a routine, but it can be done. So I showed you the effect of adding metformin onto this uh, antibiotic X. And there has been, um, the, the team has modeled other drug-drug interactions that are, that are not pharmacokinetic. By the way, the metformin had no effect on the pharmacokinetics of drug X and vice versa. 
Um, so for instance, there is one example where um, starting acetaminophen um, was observed in a clinical trial to increase ALT elevations more than you would anticipate, which is essentially none with acetaminophen. Uh, and that was successfully modeled based on additive oxidative stress. So that has not, there's, and that's not in the public domain, you know, there, the hope is always that these models will end up uh, in manuscripts. It's certainly the goal of the, the team to do that. But it's, it, I think it's an exciting area uh, you know, going forward is actually drug-drug interactions that aren't pharmacokinetic, but actually at the systems biology level. And Dilly-SIM is capable of doing that. Thank you. Um, and another question for Will. Um, a question around: Do no anti do antibacterial, sorry, lead to dementia or Parkinson's disease or al Alzheimer's disease? Yeah, I'm not an expert in that area, but I know there's been an association with antimicrobials and cognitive dysfunction. And obviously, I mentioned in my talk, you've got the individual susceptibility. Um, so Alzheimer patients are likely to be more susceptible. Um, so there is some evidence of uh, cognitive impairment and these drugs are quite um, non-selective. So a lot of them hit various ion channels uh, that are involved in neuronal function. Um, and there's also theories about affecting the gut microbiome as well, that that might be part of the mechanism. But yeah, the, they do all sorts of, uh, all sorts of things, both in the, uh, CNS and elsewhere. So, um, you know, that's certainly on the cognitive side. I'm not aware of um, implications in Parkinson's disease, but that doesn't mean that there isn't one. It's just that I'm, I'm not up with that literature. Thank you, Will. And, and then I have a sort of more, uh, a broader question for you all, actually, really, that um, you've, you've all kind of presented different tools that can be used to look at your different respective areas of, of toxicity, um, you know, in vitro, in vivo and, and um, modelling tools. But as, as we know, in, in this world of antibacterial research at the moment, many of the, the companies still in anti-infective research are, are are smaller, maybe with limited resources. So I just wondered out of your different areas, whether each of you would um, suggest what you think is the most important tool to deploy um, in a program and, and, w and when you deploy it. Julie, do you wanna start? Um, well, I've been years of experience in toxicology and both in pharmaceutical and here at Cipratex. You would certainly want to have at least some cytotoxicity data because that that can be very very helpful going forward before you go in vivo and I think we've shown there's an awful lot of mitochondrial effects um, Will mentioned it Paul certainly mentioned it as well obviously I'm slightly biased because it's my area of uh, expertise as well as my area of interest so certainly cytotoxicity you would you'd want to look at just generic cytotoxicity assays and within the mitochondrial assays, what would you say would be your first step in that in that area? I think, uh, in my opinion, um, depending on whether you know what your target is, if you know you've, you're targeting one of the DNA replications of bacterial or viral, I would probably, um, if you were limited, I would look at the biogenesis assay. But as many compounds can hit off target, then my first protocol would be seahorse. It's the most uh, specific and the most sensitive of the ones. Thank you, Julie. How about you, Paul? What do you think uh, should be deployed first in liver tests? Right. Assessment? Well, not not surprisingly, you know, I have no financial interest anymore in the success of uh, Dilly some services or Simulation Plus, but I I have a significant ego wrapped up in it, and. Uh, <laughs> You know, and I, I really think it's going to be increasingly requested by the FDA to do dilly some modeling. You know, the, the, our first Ares fellow is actually in the pharmacometrics group. They have a license uh, for dilly sim which they renewed. And I think the idea of checking those three properties and uh, unless the, the answer is no, 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 you know, going on and, and beginning this sort of quantitative systems toxicology modeling at an early stage in development will be important, uh, particularly for small companies where you've got to get uh, venture capitalists, you know, or a big company to come in and do it. I think that this will become 
a mandatory part of the aggregate safety data at a relatively early stage. Now that the what's going to what is happening now is using simulations plus admit predictor to begin to use structure activity relationships to predict mitochondrial inhibition, to predict oxidative stress, to predict interference with bioacid homeostasis. And that will be the direction of the future to screen um, you know, in silico models for those, uh, those abilities. Um, but anyway, so that's my thought now. I think um, it's gonna increasingly become a required thing for particularly for antibiotics to gather the data and depending on what you get to go forward with quantitative systems modeling, which you don't, don't have to have the, the, the company do it. You can buy a license to the software and, and do it. Uh, there's academic licenses and et cetera. A question just came in actually as you, you were um, saying that, Paul. How how useful is the DiddySIP um, Diddy Sim as an early tool if you don't have human PK data or population PK? Can it still can you still model anything? Well, what you can do is you can model those properties and then you can model what exposures would be uh, starting to cause the ALT elevations um, without any PK data at all. But obviously there are methods to estimate exposure early on. And I think as part of sort of the, the aggregate information for decision-making with a particular uh, new antibiotic candidate, it'll be useful even at a very, very early up, early point in development, even if you don't have human experience. Right now, the, um, the majority of what's been uh, done has been when there's been human experience. So you have good data for PBPK modeling. And often it's next in class where first in class had a problem. So Ubrojapan as a CGRP inhibitor was predicted by Dilysim to be safe before entering the definitive clinical trials. And it turned out to be the case and approved by the FDA without even a liver safety warning. So. Thank you, Paul. And Will, what would you say is the um, most important thing to do early in a, in a program? Well, some neurotoxicity is uh, in, within the CNS and requires crossing blood-brain barrier and some doesn't. But in terms of trying to uh, de-risk your compound, if you don't need it to get into the CNS, then um, try to keep it out. And there are PBPK models of blood-brain barrier penetration that are useful from sort of fairly simple in vitro um, data inputs. Um, the second point, and again, this was addressed in the questioning, is secondary pharmacology profiling. So you want to know if it's hitting any uh, receptors that are uh, responsible for either, you know, new neurotoxicity or functional effects in the nervous system. And I think, as you can see emerging, there are some in vitro neurotoxicity assays and they're getting to the point now where they're commercially available and proving themselves useful. So uh, talking to a specialist company that offers those um, and just, you know, see if you can distinguish between sort of cytotoxicity per se and if there's neurotoxicity occurring at a lower concentration, you may have to explore that further. So those would be my pre-in vivo early, um, early suggestions. That's great. Thank you very, very, thank you very much. Well, that's really appreciated. So um, I think we've now come to the end of the Q and A session. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for their questions and comments. And obviously, I'd really like to thank um, Julie, Paul, and, and Will for your for your great talks. Um, I'll now hand over to you, Astrid. All right. <laughs> Just had to get my slide up again. Um, well, thank you very much, Claire, for your continued support of our webinar series. Um, and thank you very much to our three speakers, even though we only see two, um, Will, Julie, and Paul. Um, I will now briefly oops, introduce, um, announce our next few webinars to our audience or to our speakers in case you're interested. So on the 21st of October, we will have a webinar about data and methods needed to de determine breakpoints for new agents. On the 27th of October, we will have a webinar about um, developing antibiotics for children. 
and on the 17th of November, we will have a webinar about discovery of new antibacterials using artificial intelligence. Um, the registration links for most of these webinars are already on our website, as he indicated on the slides. And uh, the missing one, the one for the 27th of October, will come in the next few days. I would also recommend to you to keep an eye on the website and for, at my emails, because in addition to these three, we will announce probably one or two more webinars in November. So it's a busy time here. Also, for those who joined the session today later, um, I want to remind you that all webinars are recorded and the recordings can be watched on our website. So also the recording of this webinar will be, will be up on the website probably next week. But also all webinars from our webinar, um, recordings from our webinars in 2018 and 2019 and 2020 are still available for you. Also, as I often uh, get this question from our audience, yes, you will receive a follow-up email in the next one or two weeks usually. And this includes a link uh, for um, your own cert um, certificate of attendance. All right, so that's all from my side. As always, I hope uh, this was uh, interesting for everybody. Thank you to the audience for participating uh, with your questions. And I hope to see you again on our future webinars. Thank you and goodbye, everybody. Hi, thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you very Bye. much. Bye. Bye.